Okay, so continuing with our pre-lab questions for experiment number three, we move on to question number four. And question number four is looking at the pyrolysis of your metal oxalate. Um, and basically what you're going to do is, is you are going to take your metal salt, you're going to react it with oxalic acid, you're going to form a metal oxalate. Then you're going to take that metal oxalate and pyrolyze it in order to determine what your unknown compound is based on mass. Now, in order to do this though, however, you have to have balanced chemical equations. Okay, so question number four asks us to balance each molecular equation. Now, like I've mentioned before, balancing chemical equations is basically by trial and error. So you kind of have to play around with them and play around with the coefficients in order to have everything balanced by mass, meaning every element that you have on the left hand side, the reactant side, you have to have that same number on the product side. Okay, so for this first one, we have our iron oxalate, we have our oxygen, we form FeO as our solid, we have water, and we also form some carbon dioxide. Excuse me, we form water vapor. Now, in terms of balancing these, Okay, you can really start with any element that you want, like I said, trial and error. So, if we look, we see that there are two carbons. And if we compare that to the product side, there is only one carbon. So, perhaps you can put a two here to balance the carbons. Now, I'm not saying that that might not change depending upon what else you do, but it's a good initial place to start. Okay, so we have two carbons on each side, so now we have the carbons balanced by mass we have to check all other elements. So, if we look, we have one iron on the left hand side, we have one on the right hand side. Okay, so now we have iron balanced, we have carbon balanced. Last thing we have to check is the hydrogens and the oxygens. Okay, so if we look at the hydrogens, we see that we have four hydrogens, okay, on the left hand side of the reaction. And if we compare, we see that we only have two on the product side. So, obviously the hydrogens are not balanced. So, if I place a 2 as a coefficient in front of H2O, that then gives me four hydrogens in total. So, I look, I see I have iron balanced, I have carbon balanced, and now I have my hydrogens balanced as well. So, the last thing that I have to check is my oxygens. Okay? And if I look at my oxygens, I see I have my iron oxalate dihydrate, and that in total gives me six oxygens. Okay, plus I have the two from the O2 gas, so in total I have eight oxygens on the reactant side. That means I have to have eight on the product side as well. So here I have one oxygen, I have two oxygens from my water vapor, and I have four from my carbon dioxide. So in total, that gives me seven. So what I see here is, is that my oxygens are not balanced, so I'm going to have to change a coefficient. Now, in looking at this, what you can see is, is that I only need one more oxygen. So by putting a two here, that actually changes, and now I have my oxygens balanced, okay? But the problem is, is that I've changed a coefficient. So now I have to go back and double check that everything else is still balanced. And like I said, this is by trial and error. So I already know that I have the oxygens balanced. I need to make sure that I have everything else balanced as well. And what I see is, is that I have one iron on the left hand side, I have two on the right hand side. So now I'm going to have to put a two in front of my iron oxalate. So I have two irons on each side, okay, and I look and see, okay, now I have four carbons. So I'm going to have to change this coefficient from a two to a four in order for my carbons to be balanced. So I have iron balanced, I have carbon balanced, I need to check my oxygens, and what I see is, is that I have eight here, and I have to include my hydrate, I have 2 times 2 times 1, which is another 4 oxygens. So I have 12 from the iron oxalate plus 2 more, so in total, 
14 oxygens on the left hand side. If I look on the right hand side, I've got two from FeO, I've got two from the H2O vapor, and I've got eight from the CO2 gas. Now, that only gives me 12. So if I look at this, if I change this coefficient to a four, that then gives me the correct number of oxygens, okay? So I've got my irons balanced, I've got my carbons balanced, I have oxygen balanced, I need to double check that my hydrogens are balanced as well. So if I check my hydrogens, I see that I have two times two times two, so in total that is eight hydrogens. I need to have eight on the product side as well. And I see that I have four times two, that gives me eight hydrogens, that's the only compound. So I know that everything is balanced. So I have my coefficients, I have a two in front of my iron oxalate. I have a two in front of my iron oxide. I have a four in front of my water vapor and I have a four in front of my carbon dioxide. So you saw how this was trial and error. You just have to simply play around to make sure that you have the same number of each element on both sides of the reaction, okay? Now, I'm not going to work through the remaining parts of question four, okay? You simply need to go through like I did for part A and However many reactant or elements that you have on the left hand side, you have to make sure that you have on the right hand side. But make sure that you pay attention to the hydrate, okay? When you have a coefficient here, two, what this says is that you have to take this coefficient and multiply by the number of hydrates, and then depending upon if it's hydrogen and oxygen, you may have to multiply again, okay? So Parts B and C, you should practice on your own um, in terms of balancing molecular equations, okay? So the last part, the last question of this pre-lab exercise is question number five. And if you look at it, what it says is, is that for each possible pyrolysis reaction, calculate the theoretical yield of a solid product, okay? Assuming that you use one gram of iron oxalate and that oxygen is an excess reactant, okay? Basically what this is saying is, is that if you start off with one gram of your metal oxalate, and again this goes for nickel and this goes for manganese, if you start off with one gram of your oxalate, your, your metal oxalate, how much of this solid product should you in theory, produce, okay? That's why it's called a theoretical yield. So you start off with a certain amount of reactant, in theory, how much product should you produce? That is what a theoretical yield is. Now in terms of the steps that you take to calculate a theoretical yield, it is nothing more than a mass problem. And you know that in mass problems, you have three steps. You go from grams of compound one to moles of compound one, and you do so using the molar mass. Second step is to go from moles of compound one to moles of compound two. So in this case, we would go from moles of iron oxalate to moles of FeO. And you have to have a balanced chemical equation to do this because this part, the step number two, is the stoichiometry. The third part in any mass problem is you go from moles of compound two to grams of compound two, and this again requires the molar mass of compound two. So anytime you have a mass problem, these are the three steps that you have to take, okay? It's also inadvertently calculating a theoretical yield. So if I start with one gram of metal oxalate, in theory, how much of my solid product should I form, okay? One other thing to point out is the ox oxygen here. It's mentioned that it is the excess reactant. Basically what that means is, is that it will not control the amount of product that is formed, okay? It has no, no control over the maximum amount of product that is formed. So essentially in this particular instance, we are ignoring it in our calculation, okay? 
okay? So for this, we need to calculate a theoretical yield, okay? Meaning we need to figure out how much FeO solid is formed when I start with one gram of my metal oxalate. So I have to do a mass problem. I have to do three steps, okay? Now, one other additional thing to point out to you is, is that when you get to lab, you will want to use as close to one gram of your iron uh, of your metal oxalate that you can get. Okay, this will just make it easier on you because these values that you calculate here, you will use in your data report sheet table. Okay, so you want to make sure that when you go to pyrolyze your uh, metal oxalate, okay, you get as close to one gram as you possibly can. Okay, in the balance room. All right, so. Let's figure out how much, in theory, we should form of FeO if we start off with one gram of our metal oxalate. So we have one gram of our iron oxalate in this case. If it was nickel or manganese, same thing. And we go in any first step, grams of compound one, so grams of iron oxalate dihydrate to moles of compound one. And this is going to require that you use a molar mass. And we've already calculated that in question number two. So we already know what the molar mass of iron oxalate is, which is 179.90 grams of iron oxalate dihydrate. Now, if we cancel out our units, we see that grams of iron oxalate is gone, leaving us with moles of iron oxalate. That's the first step in any mass problem, okay? The second step is to go from moles of compound one to moles of compound two. So in this instance, we wanna go from moles of iron oxalate dihydrate to moles of FeO. So that is stoichiometry. That requires a balanced chemical equation. And if you look at question number four, we already did that. We know that there is a two for a coefficient here. We know that we have a two here. We have a four here and a four here. So what this is telling us is, is that for every two moles of iron oxalate, we have two moles of FeO. And this is where I got those numbers from, from the balanced chemical equation. That is step two, that is stoichiometry. And if we cancel our units, moles is gone, leaving us with moles of compound two. The third step is to go from moles of compound two to grams of compound two, and this is going to require a molar mass. So, when I go to the periodic table and I add up 55.85 grams per mole of iron and 16 grams per mole of oxygen, I get a molar mass of 71.85 grams of FeO per mole of FeO. So when units cancel out, we're left with grams of FeO and when we do our calculation, we get an answer of 0.40 grams of FeO. So what this is saying is, is that if you start with one gram of iron oxalate dihydrate, in theory, you should produce 0 0.40 grams of FeO. So if you are doing your pyrolysis of your, of your iron oxalate and you're finished with your pyrolysis, you go back to the balance room and it, you weigh it on the balance and it weighs 0 0.40 grams. That tells you that your unknown compound is FeO, okay? So this is a mass problem and a theoretical yield problem, okay? So that was part A. Let's go on to part B. And what you'll see is, is that the process for part B and part C is exactly identical to that of part A, and again, doesn't matter if you have manganese or if you have nickel, you'll still do the exact same thing, okay? So for the second part, in theory, if we start with one gram of our oxalate,
how much of our Fe2O3 are we going to form? So in theory, we're doing a theoretical yield, we're doing a mass problem, we have to do those three steps. So grams of compound one to moles of compound one, which requires the molar mass. So we already calculated the molar mass. We don't have to do it again. 179.90 grams. So step one is done. Cancel our units. Grams is gone, we're left with moles. So that's step one in any mass problem. Okay, step two, we need to go from moles of compound one to moles of compound two. So moles of iron oxalate to moles of Fe2O3. So this again is stoichiometry and requires a balanced chemical reaction. Now, we did not go through and work them out in question number four, but had you, your balanced chemical reaction would look like this, where we would have coefficients of a four, three, two, eight, and eight. So to do mole to mole conversion, we would have two moles of Fe2O3 for every four moles of iron oxalate. And again, we want to make sure that we're setting up these problems correctly, so we cancel our units. Moles of iron oxalate dihydrate cancel moles of iron oxalate dihydrate. We're left with moles of Fe2O3. And here's where I got those numbers from, the coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction. Okay, so step two is done. Step three, we need to go from moles of compound two to grams of compound two, and this again requires the molar mass. So when I go to the periodic table and I add up two irons and three oxygens, I get a molar mass, 159.69 grams of Fe2O3 per mole of Fe2 03. And again, we want to make sure we're setting these up correctly, our conversion factors. So moles of Fe2O3 cancel, moles of Fe2O3 cancel, leaving us with grams of compound 2. So we do our calculation, we multiply across, we multiply below and divide the two, and we obtain an answer of 0.44 grams of Fe2O3. So again, if you start off with one gram of iron oxalate dihydrate, you weigh it out in the balance room, you pyrolyze it, you finish it, you go back to the balance room, and if it weighs 0.44 grams, you know what your unknown compound is. Now the other thing to pay attention to here is with significant figures. Okay, the only experimental number that we are using is 1.0. 1.0 has two sig figs, so therefore your answer needs to have two sig figs as well. And again, this applies to nickel and manganese as well. And you will be putting these answers, 0.40, 0 0.44, and the third one for part C, in your table on the data report sheet and handing that in. This is what's going to tell you what your unknown compound is after pyrolysis. Okay, so let's do the last one here. And again, this is a theoretical yield. You are doing the exact same steps. So if we start with one gram of our iron oxalate, first step is to go from grams of compound one so moles of compound one, so we need our molar mass. So we have for every one mole of FeC2O4, we have a molar mass, 179.90 grams. So we want to make sure we're setting this up correctly grams of iron oxalate dihydrate cancel grams of iron oxalate dihydrate okay so we're left with moles so that's step one step two we need to go from moles of compound one to moles of compound two and again this is going to require a balanced chemical equation so we didn't do that part in part four 
But if you went through and you balanced your chemical reaction, you'll see that we have a 2 in front of H2O. So that means for every one mole of iron carbonate, you're going to have one mole of iron oxalate. And I got those numbers because we know that there is assumed to be a 1 there. So again, we want to double check, make sure that we're on the right track, make sure that our units cancel. Moles of iron oxalate cancel moles of iron oxalate. So that is the stoichiometry, that is step 2. Okay, so the third step, again, we go from moles of compound 2 to grams of compound 2, and this requires the molar mass. So when I go to the periodic table and I add up one iron, one carbon, and three oxygens, I get a molar mass, 115.86 grams per one mole of, and what you see is, is that we cancel our units, moles cancel, we're left with grams, and so when we do our calculation, we multiply all the things on top, we multiply on the bottom, and then divide, and we know we need to have two sig figs in our answer, we get 0.64 grams of FeCO3. So again, if you start off with close to one gram of iron oxalate, and you pyrolyze it, and then you go take that back to the balance room and you weigh it out, and you're done pyrolyzing, if it weighs 0.64 grams, then you know that this has to be your product, okay? So this is stoichiometry. This is a mass problem. You see for part A, B, and C, we did the exact same thing every three times. This is a mass problem. There are three steps that you follow every single time. It's also a theoretical problem stating that if I start off with one gram of my starting material, in theory, I should produce 0.64 grams of my product, okay? So you want to make sure that you really learn how to do this. Like I said, these values you will put in the table on your data report sheet for experiment three.